Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. Change is an important part and necessary part of life at times. For instance, we, we wouldn't want to have the same food for every meal. You can't survive only on chocolate. Or, or read the same newspaper articles or wear the same clothes all week long. Uh, but change can also be difficult. The laws of physics, for instance, tell us that an object in motion wants to continue in the same motion in the same way until some outside force forces it to change. It's not always easy to change where we live or what we're used to doing. Change is complicated, but changes sometimes are necessary and for the better. Our reading from Acts chapter 9 is one of the most dramatic personal changes uh, really, in, in all of recorded human history, Saul from Tarsus was an obsessive and violent opponent of the way of Jesus. Saul was not satisfied with the disciples simply keeping a low profile. Paul went on the attack. Um, early on in the book of Acts, the disciples, we see them getting into trouble after they do preaching, but they're really only arrested to start with when they do stuff on the temple grounds. The first arrest comes after Peter and John healed a lame man, and that probably wouldn't have got them arrested, but then they preached Jesus in the temple. And the ESV puts it this way, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead, and they arrested them. That's, I think, a good summary. They were greatly annoyed. When the apostles interfered in the official temple business, uh, the official temple leaders had them arrested. This happens again in Acts chapter 5, almost the same exact kind of thing happening. The disciples and way of Jesus was an annoyance to most of the Jewish religious hierarchy. The first time we see the opponents of the way of Jesus becoming more aggressive, however, is when Stephen is martyred. And Saul was uh, officially a part of this more aggressive policy towards those who followed the way. Because but Saul was not really content simply with Stephen's death. No, Paul was a real go-getter, a go-getter of the disciples of Jesus. That is, Paul quite literally began going to get disciples, ferreting them out, dragging them before the Sanhedrin uh, with murderous intentions. And that's what set Paul apart from the other leaders. The chief priests stopped the disciples from speaking about Jesus in the temple. When the disciples, in other words, stepped on their turf, they retaliated and prosecuted and arrested. But they weren't really going out of their way to shut down the way. However, the, the mere fact that the way of Jesus existed at all offended Paul to his core. He thought they were a blasphemous stain on true religion, and he wanted them wiped out. Paul was not content with stopping Christians. He wanted to snuff them out entirely. And he was convinced that he was right and that Yahweh would have supported him. But that all came to a grinding halt when he was blinded by the light. Saul immediately recognized that the Lord of Israel was speaking to him on the road, but it was the shock of his life that the Lord of Israel was in fact Jesus whom he had despised and whose disciples he was murdering. Well, that's not the last dramatic change in this story. Uh, if we had more time or another time, there will probably be a sermon on Ananias. But Jesus appeared to Ananias as well. And Ananias' uh, change was just about as dramatic, an, an ankle-breaking kind of pivot that he takes. I mean, if you could think about it, it's quite possible that Ananias was one of the top men 
on Paul's hit list. Ananias had been running away from Saul, but now he would go to him. The man who he was praying he would never see, he would give sight to. This was Paul, Saul, I mean, the most influential and capable leader of the resistance, the way of Jesus. The, the, the best that they had, the, their best weapon, but now the, the script had been flipped and the tables had been turned. Everything had changed for Paul. Um, um, the circumstances of Paul's conversion, uh, you know, the blinding light, the scales forming, falling from his eyes, it's all quite dramatic. Paul's attitude has changed just as dramatically. Um, now Paul stood against everything he had once stood for, and he, he was fearlessly defending, and even, we'll see later, laying down his life for that which he had previously attacked so ruthlessly. What's more, Paul's, Paul caused a gigantic change, a cataclysmic shift in the spread of the good news. In his violent zeal, Saul had chased the gospel outside of Jerusalem. The more aggressive policy towards the way, perhaps even initiated by Saul, had directly led, for instance, to the Ethiopian eunuch's baptism and to Samaritans believing the gospel and becoming part of the way of Jesus. But when Paul changed, the spread of the gospel changed even more dramatically. After his conversion, Paul carried the gospel to the ends of the known world, always looking to bring the gospel even further. The gospel of Jesus changes things. Quite often, the changes are dramatic, life-altering. It turned Paul's life upside down. The gospel turns our lives upside down, too. Jesus put it this way, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Because the dramatic change, perhaps the most dramatic change in our life, is that as Christians, we are no longer the center of our own life. It's no longer about what's in it for me or what's best for me. You know, I, can't, I really can't overestimate how drastically different Jesus teaches you and me to approach life and decisions in our life. Some of our, our most basic instincts, like uh, preservation of self, or some of the most in, ingrained things society teaches us, like living as consumers, are, are directly in conflict with the call of Jesus. Um, Jesus changes us dramatically, and I, and I want to consider three extremely personal ways that Jesus calls you and I to live differently. For starters, Jesus teaches us that possessions are not really our possessions. They are gifts to use to love God and neighbor. They are things to be used honorably and, and for the good of others. Jesus says we are caretakers of and, and responsible for seeing these things entrusted to us that they're used in a positive manner, i.e. for the good of God or for the good of our neighbor, not just however we see fit. Similarly, our sexuality is a gift or, or better yet, something entrusted to us by God. Our sexual expression is a major part of who we are. It's true. But it's important to remember, it's a gift, not simply a gain. Human beings can and often do get sexuality wrong, just like we do in every other area of our life. It's, but it's such a personal part of us, and it's, one of the, it's really an opportunity. It's one of the most personal ways we can experience both law and gospel, instruction and forgiveness. It's an opportunity to live genuinely striving to put the words of Christ into action personally. Another great example is what we might call our free time or our extra energy. I mean, a lot of our time and energy is already accounted for. I mean, roughly a third of our time is necessary for rest and typically about a third of our time or more for work. And then we're left with you know, maybe it's a little, slightly less than a third of our time is more flexible. We have more control over. 
So how do we use that free time? Well, free time is not simp designed simply to veg out or please ourselves. Rather, God frees us from guilt and shame and even selfishness so that we can live freely showing Christ's love to others, so that we can live building one another up. Um, our time is given to us to pursue God's kingdom in our interaction with one another, with creation, and with our creator. I mean, of course, there's a lot more to be said about all that we can't say now, uh, but frankly, I, I personally, I feel like I, I should have been or we should, I would like to provide more help and support for us in these three important and really personal areas of our life as, as we seek to follow Christ. Because Christ calls us to change the way that we use our bodies, time, and stuff. And sometimes, as I said earlier, change is hard. But we've got to remember that God's plan is a good plan. And we can trust him. In Galatians chapter 5, Saul makes a simple point. We are freed from the sorts of desires that control and consume so many people around us. Compulsions like out-of-control sexuality, jealousy, anger, divisions, drunkenness, among others. These are obsessions. And, and of course, sometimes we, um, we fall prey to these sorts of emotions um, and desires, but they should no longer define our lives or or drive our decisions and lifestyles. Rather, our lives are, as Paul, Saul says, to show the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, it's important to remember, and this is where our Lutheran heritage really helps us, since we are all sinners, we know that this is something that is not necessarily very easy to do. It's something that we all struggle with. Even lifelong Christians, we still need God's grace, forgiveness, and his Holy Spirit's help to, to do this, to strive in that direction. Uh, we constantly need to, as we talk about change, we constantly need to change, to repent, and to reorient ourselves back towards Christ because it's very easy to get turned in the wrong direction or slightly or majorly off track. But the good news is, is that Jesus walks with us on our journey. And he keeps walking with us even when we make mistakes, even when we're not sure exactly what to do next. Jesus is still a God who calls us to dramatic change. And the good news is that while the changes Jesus seeks to implement in our lives are sometimes difficult, they are always good. And he is triumphant. He is changing you and me. Alleluia. In Jesus' name, amen.